Uh, certainly, I, I would expect Jalen to play really solid football this year. Uh, he has the athleticism to be able to make plays with his legs. I mean, he's, he's quite an exceptional individual when it comes to being able to do stuff like that. So from my perspective, um, I, I think the Eagles are, are one of those teams that can really certainly contend in the division. And depending on how healthy people are, uh, they can be a handful for everybody. Hey, I tell you what, man, I want to get our friend's response here on Deshaun Watson, but I first want to start it out in Philadelphia. He's a former National Football League's most valuable player. He is our friend. He is Joe Theismann. Joe, how you doing, brother? Hi, Dan. How are you? <laughs> All good. Hey, before we get to Deshaun Watson, I Joe, give me your thoughts on Jalen Hurts and this Philadelphia Eagles team in 2022. What are your expectations with this team? Well, you know, because they're in the NFC East, I hope their expectations aren't real good, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, 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 that's the homer in me, being a Washington guy. I, I really think that uh, between Philadelphia and Miami, I believe that those two football teams – really did a great job of putting people around the quarterback position. And Dan, how many times have you heard me say the quarterback position is the single most dependent position on the field? Uh, certainly I, I would expect Jalen to play really solid football this year. Uh, he has the athleticism to be able to make plays with his legs. I mean, he's, he's quite an exceptional individual when it comes to being able to do stuff like that. So from my perspective, um, I, I think the Eagles are, are one of those teams that can really certainly contend in the division. And depending on how healthy people are, uh, they can be a handful for everybody. Joe, do you think he do, do, do you think he has the ability to be a franchise guy? And I mean, is he the answer at that position, or do we still are we in that mode of still incomplete yet on figuring who he is and what he's able to do for a roster? I, I think I think he's at a stage trying to figure out exactly how his growth will be in this game. I mean, every every game you grow, every year you grow, every offseason, every practice, you have an opportunity to be able to learn more. The, the great thing about the position that we play, Dan, is it's it's a continuing learning process on a daily basis. You go out and practice, you go through practice and you make a throw or you make a decision and you reflect back on it and say, OK, you know, this is let's put this one in the bank that I don't want to do or I want to release the ball a little bit quicker. Or if we get this kind of a look as you sit and study film, you sit there with your receivers and say, listen, I know what the route is. But if you get this look, just plant your foot in the ground and take it up and we'll, we'll, we'll make something happen. So those are all part of the process. I, he's a smart young guy. He's been in some different systems and adjusted very well to all of them. Um, I I would expect him to have a really, really solid year this year. I think uh, a lot of the process of learning, uh, the foundational learning is behind him. And now he's in a, in a place where he's had the same system uh, for a couple of years. And that's what I would, I would expect it to be a, a good year for him. Joe, for the position of quarterback, when you add a talent like an A.J. Brown and you're going through the maturation process of learning – how to progression read. And I tell people this all the time in college. See, I don't think the ad average fan understands this show. I mean, in college, the coach tells you where to throw the ball. When you're in the NFL, you've got to have a predetermined snap idea where it's going. And once you get to the line of scrimmage, you still may not even know where it's going until the last five seconds before the play clock goes off. So you're going through all that, but then you add a guy like a player like AJ Brown, who's an elite player at that position what does that do for a quarterback and having a guy like that in your huddle I think it gives you great confidence um, and, and that confidence will only grow as the games go on and as the season goes on right now you develop a chemistry through training camp the OTAs the mini camps and all that kind of stuff but once the season starts uh, you you find out exactly if he's scrambling around does does he find AJ yeah, I mean you know what's what's the receiver's ability to be able to get into the vision of the quarterback so that you can get the ball out of your hands and he can make plays for you. I, I think it's, you know, when you really break, when you really break games down, I mean, if, if one receiver is targeted 10 times in a game, that's a lot. I mean, really, when you think it, you're running 65, 67 plays and, and 10 of them are targeted for a particular receiver. 
you still have four other receivers that you want to get the ball to. You're probably going to run the football anywhere between 25 and 30 times if you're a good offense and you want to protect your quarterback. So if you if you say you're targeting him 10 times and you're throwing the ball, let's say 35, that's about a third of the throws going to one individual. Uh, defenses aren't going to allow you to do that. They're going to dictate for you to go to someplace else. And you brought up a great point, by the way, is – in college, you're basically it's one, maybe two, or look at this side and throw the football. Uh, some of them spread it out with guys moving around a little bit more because that's really where the game has gone. But at the professional level, you're always dealing with looks and then another look, and then another look sometimes. So you get an idea. You can anticipate a little bit what you're going to get, whether it's man or zone. You can anticipate the roll to one side or the other. But you still have to be able to work through the holes, the linebackers, the safeties, and, and the corners. Joe, take me through your process. Would, would, was it a quick learn for you once you started learning? And again, I mean, you got Joe Gibbs, too, who's there with you and teaching you again to play. the. I mean, here's I say Joe Gibbs is one of the greatest, if not the top three greatest coaches in the history of the league because he took three different dudes at that position to the Super Bowl finish line. I mean – all those yeah. guys learned how to play the position and understand the position. I think he's a Coriel guy, if I'm not mistaken. I think yep. he learned a little bit under Don there. So did what did it come quick for you being able to learn how to read and progression read? Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, I played for I played for George Allen. First coach I had was Teddy Marchabroda under George Allen in, in the early 70s. Oh. He gave me a reel, and at that time they only played 11 basic defenses. So before I ever looked at a, 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 our play sheets, before I ever looked at our formations, before I ever looked at our plays, he told me to study defenses. He said, you study these. Once you understand what people are trying to do to you, then you're going to have a chance to be able to do what we want to do against them. But the guy that really taught me how to play the position was Joe Walton. You know, Joe has a stadium named after him. Uh, and uh, right. Former Jets so. coach. Yeah, he was a former Jets coach, Pittsburgh Steeler coach. Uh, uh, but Joe Walton taught me the basics of fundamentally how to play the position of quarterback, what I want to read, taught me how, how steps coincide with depths of routes. Uh, we read, see, back then we read linebacker drops. We read safeties, positioning of safeties. And then when Coach Gibbs came, it was initially a system that he had run with Don Coriel, but that wasn't very successful for us. I mean, the first five games of the season, we were 0-5. I was going to get benched. And because uh, they were going to fire him, they just hired him. So um, I was, you know, my job was on the line. And Joe changed our offense where we ran the ball a little bit more. We took advantage of the size of the guys up front. My job was to keep the chains moving. And then when we got in the red zone to be able to make the plays that we needed to. To this day, he's one of the greatest minds when it comes to getting the ball in the end zone from the red zone, which is the plus 20 and in. So I concur with you about him being a top three coach in the, in the history of this game, obviously. Not only did he take three quarterback, different quarterbacks, which and each system evolved. Because with me, we, we had three wide receivers. By the time he got to Rip, you know, Doug was the one in San Diego and Rip was the one in Minnesota. By the time he got to Rip, they were running four wides. Yeah. So the offense just continued to evolve. And this was Joe. It continued to grow and evolve. And I think one of the things that was interesting about, I know the guys that I played with, is Coach used to just give us as much as he could to see if we could handle it. And we never got to a point where he backed off and said, oh, this is too much for him. He just kept throwing stuff at us, and we kept processing it, and, and we just grew. And he made it fun. You know, we'd come out for practice on Wednesday, and Joe would have come up with you know, this formation where John Riggins is on the wing, Art Monk is in the backfield, um, you know, you, the, the tight ends are outside, the wide receivers are inside. And then we'd shift or we'd stay in that formation. We'd have a running play, we'd have a play action pass, and we'd have a drop back pass. So by the time Sunday rolled around, Dan, I'm like a little kid in a candy store. <laughs> When's he going to call this? What are we going to do? And every time he did that, he made practice exciting and fun. He made it interesting, taught us to learn. But he also got us in positions where there were positive plays. They just weren't, quote, unquote, gimmick plays. They were plays that he designed to get us a first down, to get us five or six yards, maybe a shot at a big play. And, and that's the genius of Joe, I call it. But he really created the system. But fundamentally, I was taught by Joe Walton. I got to tell you a funny story. So I'm sitting down with Coach Gibbs in my first meetings with him. 
And Joe had taught me to read linebackers and safeties, Joe Walton. So I'm sitting there with Coach Gibbs, and, of course, we got the Coriel system, and, you know, Dan's been throwing it all over the place. He's got Kellen and J.J. and all these guys. So I'm sitting there, and I said, uh, hey, Coach, um, who do you want me to read on this particular play, the safety or the linebacker? And he says, uh, throw it to the open receiver. <laughs> I, said, I said, I really want to do that. But, you know, I mean, is there anybody in particular you'd like me to read, the safety or the or the uh, – a linebacker at that time we had projectors. So he turned the projector off and he goes, Joe, look, it's a simple game. Just throw it to the wide receiver. Okay? It's that simple. And so that, that's basically, you know, that's, that's what it was, but he was, he was creative as far as patterns and routes and everything goes. And he just wanted you to throw it to the open receiver. Simple things sometimes are the most hardest things to accomplish yes, at times, I, I guess. I, I love that advice. Let me keep you in Washington then. Carson Wentz, have you been impressed with him? Do you think he has a bounce back? And do you think he's your guy moving forward? Or, yet again, another incomplete still? Uh, you know, I think I think time will only tell. Um, I think Carson has everything that he needs to do to be successful here. I believe the football team around him uh, is pretty darn good, too. One of the areas that hasn't been talked about a lot in the Washington over the last couple of years is the offensive line. Some of the guys are banged up a little bit, but there's tremendous versatility up front. You know, the centers can play. The center can be a guard. The guard can be a center. The tackle play inside. I mean, they've got a lot of guys that can move around, and they've had to in the past. Carson can definitely be there. I mean, you look at his statistics from last year, 27 touchdowns, seven interceptions. There isn't a guy in this league that wouldn't take a four-to-one touchdown to interception ratio. Right. So he was fundamentally able to do that. I think for him, what's important is trying not to do too much. When he came back from his injury in Philadelphia, I think he felt like he was going to be the same player he was, but I, I believe that need limited him and, and he had to adjust. And then in Indianapolis, you know, some decisions with the ball in your hands, he made a couple of ones that, that didn't turn out very well. He also was, you know, I mean, there were some games that it wasn't all on him. If you if you look at the Indianapolis Colts last year, people are saying, oh, it was Carson this, it was Carson that. Hey, there were games where that defense gave up over 400 yards of offense. Hey, Joe, last year the guy had 3,700 yards, 27 touchdowns, seven picks, and yeah. I tell everybody, all that equity that he built up with his team and with his coach, eight minutes versus the Titans and that Jaguar game, it just erased it all, and it's unfortunate because right. – that, that's how I saw his season. I mean, they played great against the Buccaneers. They played great against the Bills. I mean, he had a really good season, but that decision-making, that hero ball stuff, I tell people this, Joe, the greatest thing that a quarterback can do sometimes is throw it in the stands. Yeah, Play another day. Believe me. That's, that's why there's other guys out there, Dan. That's why you have a defense. That's why you have a punter. You know, I mean, that's why you have running backs. Um, and like I said, I think in Carson's case, physically, he can he, he's got the strongest arm on the team. I believe that's a lot of the reason why they brought him in, because they want to stretch the field a little bit more. They want to be able to get the ball down the field. Uh, I'll tell you, look, Taylor's looked real good in camp as well. But of course, he's been in the system again. You know, Taylor Heineke could start somewhere in the National Football League. Huh? I promise you that. Um, now he's in a situation where it'll be in the last year of a contract. Carson we hope will come in and play really solid football. And today I was out of practice today, for example, and, and what they're doing is they're still rotating the quarterback position with Sam, as well as uh, Taylor and, and Carson. Um, I, I feel like start next week, Carson's going to get a lot more reps and he'll be able to get into a groove a little bit more. It's hard to go three or four plays and go out. And then the other two quarterbacks. So you go three or four plays and then you sit for six or eight, and then you go back in and it's just, it's not the way a game is played. And I, I'm once, once he finds that stroke, that comfort level, I think he'll feel a lot better and, and, you know, things will look for him uh, a lot more clear, but you're right. The big, the big thing is, is don't be afraid to take a sack. Don't be, don't try and make the big play. Maybe you get away with it once, but more than likely it's going to come back and bite you. I have to ask you now about the Deshaun Watson situation. And I got to tell you, Joe, this just shows you one thing. Look at the look, look at the need at that position that you would have all that hanging around a player's neck and you would still guarantee $260 million knowing the blowback you're going to get from all of this. 
I got to tell you, Joe, for me, as I start the question out to you here, I think the Browns won and I think Watson won because this thing could have been even more so where he doesn't play. And again, I'm not talking about morality here. I'm talking about business for the Browns. They, they're they're going to outrun this thing here. A couple wins here and there. And guess what? You're going to be moving on your way. I mean, I just am shocked that they you know, put that kind of investment into a player with that kind of issues. I think you go back. A, a lot of times you're compensated on what you did, not potentially what you might be able to do. Uh, the last time Deshaun Watson played football, he was very impressive. Uh, the Browns are in a very desperate situation. I believe they feel like they have the pieces around the position of quarterback to be extremely competitive all the way across the board. And I mean, they've got a solid running game, good offensive line defense is doesn't get the credit that it gets. Uh, so if you look at the elements around that position, I believe that's why they made the investment. It's interesting that it's an 11 game suspension. Uh, if it was 12 games, he would have lost this year. Um, and and it, so it, you know, it, it changes the compensation a little bit uh, for what he wound up, you know, he'll wind up being able to do. And uh, also, interestingly enough, the 12th game of the season is the Browns at Houston. I know. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, the National Football League um, examines every case differently, every individual differently when it comes to the disciplines, and they make the decisions. Uh, and I, that's really where I leave it. Um, uh, it. There's really nothing else that I could add because I'm, you know, you know what you read, you know what you hear, um, but it's it's a decision that the National Football League made. The Players Association, I'm sure, accepted it, and and the deal is done. So, in Week 12, Deshaun Watson will be the quarterback of the uh, of the Cleveland Browns. And Joe, you know why I love talking to you because you and Sims are such. You, you guys are quintessential leaders of your football team because I asked him a question about Lawrence Taylor a couple of years ago. And one of the things that I loved about Phil was this. I asked him, I go, I'll never forget the media came in and I asked you right away and you go, right when LT got suspended for drugs, hey, we'll welcome him back when he comes back and we'll have him as a member of our football team. Well, are you disappointed? Hey, I just told you something here. We're going to welcome him back as a member of our football team. And that's all I got to say. And, you know, for a meathead like me, that's a defensive lineman. You know, I'm, I don't want to answer those questions, but a guy like you, that's like the face of a franchise, a quarterback. It, that, that's what's got to be said in places of leadership like that. And so I, I, I respect what you're saying there because you know that that question is going to be asked to the other 52 guys in the locker room. Sure. I mean, that's the, the, that that's I think that's got to be the, one of the toughest jobs for yeah. Kevin is as a head coach, you have to prepare your football team uh, for the questions that will be asked about one of the members of the football team, and you have to basically I mean in the old days everything stayed in the family everything stayed in the locker room uh, you know there was conversations there were things you know guys felt one way guys might have felt another but. I think from the Browns standpoint, they'll want to be able to have a unified answer. Uh, and I think they'll probably say, look, Deshaun's not on this football team right now. Uh, we're going to go out and do what we can with Jacoby. We're going to support him. We're going to do what we can to win football games. And, and I get, I'm, I'm pretty well confident that that's what you're going to hear from every one of the Cleveland Browns. Finally here, Cowboys, Giants, Eagles. What was Joe Theismann's rivalry? And I, I get Cowboys. I get it. But, man, that NFC East back when you played, they were all – there was no layup weekend. I mean, and by the way, if I'm not mistaken, weren't the Cardinals in the a NFC East back in the day? Were they, were they still in the NFC East, Joe? Um, were the Cardinals in there? No. We played them, but we, I don't – I'm not I thought the Eagles. Sure. I, I thought the I Cardinals were in the East for a bit. For I mean, a if, if there were five teams, possibly, yeah, it, there's very well could because I mean we've seen so much change. I mean, I came in the league, Dan, when there were 14 games and six preseason games. Oh like I went to train. I was I was laughing with the guys yesterday and today. They, they have 17 days of training camp, of which I believe they can hit three. I had six weeks of preseason games, of which we hit every week. 
twice a week at least. Don't forget Friday, those Saturday. three days, Joe. Oh yeah, three days under George Allen. It started at, at uh, eight o'clock in the morning and finished at six o'clock at night. And you know, it was one of the most refreshing things that happened to me during training camp was our locker room was cool. So when you took your wet pads off after the second practice and put them on getting ready for the third one, at least you had cool pads to put on. <laughs> you know, you know, Dad, you look for those little pleasures in oh, life. Yeah. And that was a little pleasure. But um, yeah, it's it's a it, it's very different when it comes to the the amount of time that guys get. And I made this point the other day to somebody. If you're a wide receiver or you're a wide, or you're a running back like Antonio Gibson put the ball on the ground. He fumbled six times last year. Now he's sort of on call a little bit. And, uh, you know, Ron has, you know, is splitting time now with the young kid at Alabama. And I mean, you don't get a lot of chances. You get three preseason games of which you're going to play in. And if you're a starter, you're not going to play much at all. If you're a wide receiver trying to make this foot, a football team anywhere, you can't afford a drop. If you're an offensive lineman, you can't afford a miss block. The pressure is so much greater on the guys trying to make teams today than it was in the past because you had a bigger body of work to choose from. Now the body of work is so small that one particular instant, one particular mistake, it, it may be the one that gets you out the door, or it could be the one that keeps you there too. I mean, when you were there, I think you guys only had 40 – maybe 47 guys, I think it yeah. was. Now you've got 16 practice guys and 50, 53 on a team. I mean, Joe, you almost got – I mean, you'd have played 100 years if you played today. <laughs> I mean – Well, I, I don't just, know if I would have in this division. I mean, as you know, as, as tough as the Giant defense was, Bill Berge and that Eagle defense, the same way with Herm Edwards there. And, of course, the Cowboys. I mean, you know, Randy White, White Ed Tuttle, Jones, Harvey Martin, John Dutton um, – Chip Harris, uh, Everson Walls. You know, some days I can close my eyes and I hear the name Cowboys and I see all those faces again, Dan. It's like <laughs> that's, that's it's hey, like a bad that's dream. Scary, man. <laughs> hey, hey, go. So you see Big Hands Johnson, Bergy, and then you see LT, and then you see I, then you see Randy White and Harvey Martin and them dudes, man. That and, and back then, Joe. They weren't very kind to you, dudes. Well, they weren't kind. Plus, the, the, the officiating was a little bit different. It was like, <laughs> you better darn well protect yourself because that's the way the game was. And, you know, and you know, I, I played at a time when the game was different, but I love the game of football today. And I think the officials have a, a really challenging job. And, you know, technology is, is doing the best it possibly can. At times you look at replay, everybody thinks, oh, it's got to be this way. And it goes the other way. And you're going, why do we have replay? But um, – and, and good for the young guys, good for the amounts of money they're making. I'm, I'm thrilled for, you know, a guy like Tariq or a guy like uh, Russell Wilson, you know, guys that are, are doing Patrick Mahomes. One quick funny story. I think it's funny anyway. When Patrick Mahomes got his $400 million, he bought a piece of the Kansas City Royals. Huh. Uh, in 1984, I was the fourth highest paid player in the National Football League at a million dollars a year. I sponsored a Little League football team. So we both managed to sponsor athletic organizations. <laughs> hey, you know, and I, I, I'll tell you this. So I, I get a, I get it like a five hundred thousand dollars signing bonus from the Buccaneers. And Jeez. Wait, check it out. I get a five. Okay, so my legendary Hall of Fame uncle Andy Robustelli, fourteen years. You know, I mean, with those great giant defenses back in the day, I didn't make five hundred grand my entire career. And I go, yeah, well, you guys rolled your helmets up and put them in your back pocket. I mean, <laughs> he's like. Son, you ain't playing in that era. <laughs> I love yeah. it, Joe. Awesome stuff as always, man. Thank you so much for coming aboard. God bless, my friend. Always great to join you, Dan. Take care. Bye-bye. You got it. That is the great Joe Theismann, former NFL Most Valuable Player.